Hi, my name is Keith Siller. I'm a professor of neuroscience at the University of St Andrews and my research interests are in how the nervous system controls movements in animals and humans. Oh yes, absolutely. The cortex of the brain, that large and highly folded exterior bit that lies just underneath our skulls, is divided into areas that have particular roles to play in controlling our different behaviours. For example, if you take your fingers and you place them roughly over the middle of your head, you're over the part of the brain that you actually used in order to move your fingers, and that's called the motor cortex. But if you move them slightly more to the back, then you're over the part of the cortex that allows you to sense the touch of your fingers on your scalp. Further back still is the area of the brain that processes the images that have started with light coming into your retina. And if we go even further back to the base of the skull, you're over an area of brain called the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is really important in allowing us to learn how to do new motor skills, like riding a bike, for example, or juggling. Well, the really important thing to remember about research is that it's useful in its own right because it generates new information about the world that was previously not known. And it's a real privilege to do experiments and to know that you're the first person on the planet to unravel the secrets of how things work. But the real purpose of research is twofold. First of all, it's used to explain the world around us and so the information is published in scientific reports and in textbooks. And that information can be used to teach the next generation about how things work. Secondly, some of what we learn has practical benefits, to the, particularly to the medical profession, because we're always working towards finding new ways to help humans. And the first clues to new remedies often come from research on non-human animals and in universities. In my own research, I've worked on new drugs designed to help people suffering from chronic pain, for example and also to learn how anaesthetics work. But I've also used frog eggs and embryo development to study how glucose affects the spinal cord during development in relation to diabetes. The possibilities are really endless and there is so much still to learn. In many cases, new discoveries are made simply by chance. Experiments can often throw up unexpected results and that really makes research especially exciting. Well, that really is an interesting question. Um, in the last few years, along with some colleagues in St Andrews, we discovered a new form of memory that occurs in the circuits of nerve cells in the spinal cord. And it involves a really common protein that's present in every nerve cell of the brain called the sodium pump. And there can be up to 30 million of these proteins in each nerve cell. And collectively, they consume about 50% of all of the energy that the brain uses. Now, in the case of the tadpole spinal cord, the memory trace that these proteins uh, create helps tadpoles to pace their swimming so that they don't become completely exhausted if they're being chased, for example, by a predator. Oh, I wish I knew so that I could get there first. But seriously, the beauty of doing research is partly that you just don't know what might be around the corner and every experiment is really just a window from which to view the next set of questions. But if I were to guess, I would say it's probably in the study of sodium pumps in human nerve cells and the opportunities to design new drugs that act on them to help with a myriad of diseases in humans where we know that these proteins are involved. Parkinson's disease, for example, because similar symptoms occur when the pumps suffer from a mutation. Well, that question takes me straight back to a lecture in my first year at Glasgow University. I remember going to university mainly because all of my school pals were going. And I decided to study zoology, partly because I found animals fascinating as a child. But also watching David Attenborough on TV played a big part in sparking my interest. But the lecture that really changed my life was about how nerve cells make muscles contract to allow us to move around. It was a real eureka moment for me. I remember thinking, wow, so that's how that works. And then thinking how much we take our physiology for granted. 
But consider the complexity of even the simplest thing that we do, like riding a bicycle, and then marvel about our ability to juggle or to dance or to play sports. The study of movement turned into a lifelong fascination and doing research to find out more is really my idea of heaven. I didn't believe and I still don't believe that people can become scientists only if they don't read anything. 